again, thank you for that introduction and thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really glad to be back here in Indiana and to give this talk today. So uh, the symposium topic today is antibiotic free production and what I was asked to do is to tell you the duck story. So what challenges we have encountered during the transition to antibiotic free and what are the possible solutions that we could use from a live production perspective. So I think what I'm going to do is to first give you a background uh, introduction about the global duck industry because many of you probably aren't that familiar with ducks as you do with chickens or turkeys and then we will talk about challenges and strategies and when I talk about antibiotic free, I talk more in terms of non-antibiotics ever uh, instead of just using antibiotics as growth promoters. Okay, so for the global duck production, apparently compared to broiler production, the global duck meat production is a relatively small section. However, it is still an economically important section and has been uh, rapidly growing. As you can see from this graph, uh, the the total duck production increased from about 3 million metric tons back in 2000 to about 4.5 million metric tons in 2013. So about 50% increase there. And among all the duck producing countries, uh, you can imagine Asia accounts for more than 80% of that total production, whereas China accounts for 80% of that regional output and contributes to more than two thirds of the global total. Uh, right after Asia comes Europe, which produces about 12% of the global duck production, and that many comes from France, uh, Germany, UK, and Hungary. For us here in the US, as you can see here in the red pie, we account for approximately 1.5% of the global total, and that was 2013 data. At that time, we ranked 11th in the world, which, which isn't a bad ranking at all. <laughs> So in the US for duck production, the top three sta states would be Indiana, California, and Pennsylvania. And the Indiana being the number one duck producing state is many because uh, of the location of Maple Leaf Farms, uh, which is the largest picking duck breeding and producing company. We're right here in this uh, North Indi Indiana area. So I was trying to understand why the duck industry here in North America is not as big as what we have in Asia. And I think one of the reasons is because of the relatively limited recipes for ducks, right? Because traditionally people here tend to think of ducks as games and not something that can be on the dinner table every day. And people also tend to think ducks are very fat. Well, in fact, they're really not. If you compare the nutritional fact of, of skinless duck breast to chickens, it actually contains less calorie and less fat. Duck legs, same thing, less calories and less fat than turkey dark meat or beef. So it really is an excellent source of protein. So here in the US, the breast meat is probably the most utilized part of a meat duck uh, that you can get from many restaurants. Sometimes you can get duck wings or legs, but that's pretty much about it. Whereas if you go to Asian countries, in addition to many traditional recipes for whole ducks, Literally every part of a duck can be, can be prepared into a dish. So duck head, tongue, blood, neck, feet, intestine, liver, gizzard, everything. So I guess what I'm trying to say is eat more ducks, everyone, because that's really the motive of our industry in, in any livestock industry. And in case you don't know, on our website you can find um, many recipes for, for ducks that you could follow at home. You can also buy ducks online if you can't find it in your local grocery store. So you should really try it out if you haven't yet. All right, speaking of, about food, how many of you have tried the famous Peking roast duck? Well, a lot of people, surprisingly. Okay, so we have to notice that for this dish, uh, it's spelled P-E-K-I-N-G, and that is not to be confused with the breed, Peking duck, without the G. So Peking duck is the predominant breed uh, for commercial duck production globally, uh, which accounts for more than 95% of the total duck produced in the US. And in China, that tw about 20% of that is replaced by some other local breeds. But regardless, um, Peking duck is still the predominant breed. And these ducks are known for their fast growth rate and um, really high feed efficiency. So over the past few decades, we have seen tremendous improvements in Peking duck breeding. So take maple leaf duck as an example. Today, a typical maple leaf duck 
can reach market weight at about 3.1 kilograms uh, in about 30 to 33 days. Sometimes we even get 30 days with an FCR of 1.7, which are huge improvements from 49 days or uh, 3.1 FCR back in 1980. Breast muscle yield, which is the most important trait here in North America, can reach 20% of that carcass weight and carcass skin and fat are continuing to decrease as well. So meat duck really has excellent potential to help meet the global demand for high quality protein going forward. And uh, with the advances in genetics, in nutrition, in management, uh, we would expect that the global duck industry will continue to grow. So with the current and future growth of the duck industry, uh, it is inevitable that we are with everyone else in this tide of antibiotic-free transition. So let's look at, the, look at where we are now on that transition. Well, for the duck industry, just like for any poultry or livestock in general, Europe is leading that transition. Whereas Asia, as the biggest producer, is still lagging behind, but it is moving slowly towards that uh, direction. In most of the Asian countries, uh, most of the ducks are still produced by a large number of local farmers. So as you can imagine, biosecurity measures or farm uh, environments are often not to the standards that we have here in the US. So that adds difficulty to the transition. But in the last few years, especially uh, the last two years, there has been an increasing pressure both from the public and from uh, the government to reduce antibiotic use and uh, to use it more responsibly. So now in China, governments really starts to closely monitor that antibiotic use and many of the big integrators are making that commitment. So hopefully we will see that China is, uh, will get to uh, where we are now in the next five to 10 years. Now, if you look at this background map, this is actually a FAO forecast for the growth in, po in demand for poultry meat in 2030, so in about 13, 20, uh, 12 years. So uh, Asia is apparently most of the growth can be, where most of the growth can be expected. So it is important to, to watch where they're going, uh, which direction they're going. Now for us in the US, we have been working really hard on that transition. Uh, for if taking maple leaf as an example, we um, currently produce 70 to 90 percent of our total market duck antibiotic free or no antibiotics ever, uh, depending on who you talk to. But it basically means no antibiotics used in the hatchery for the egg or during the entire grow out period. We, in fact, we actually start, start all of our ducks antibiotic free, but in the real, real world, we're not achieving 100% success uh, due to various obstacles. On average, we do get 80%. Uh, so, like, just like any other poultry, producing high quality duck meat without the support of the antibiotics is a huge challenge, especially if we want them to achieve optimal performance in welfare. So, what are the challenges that we, we have encountered? So, for um, antibiotic free broiler or turkey production, everybody knows that intestinal health poses the biggest challenge where we're here. Coxidiosis, necrotic enteritis control all the time that we have heard a lot today already. You might be surprised to learn that for ducks, this is less of an issue. Well, let's take a look at this graph. So for ducks, you can see that we have a much higher growth rate compared to briars. Same thing, to, same thing when compared to turkeys. In fact, turkey poults and ducklings, they hatch from uh, uh, eggs from, of similar weights. They have the same incubation period. 28 days, and the hatch at, they have similar hatch weights, but post-hatch growth of a duckling far exceeds that of a, of a turkey poult. So Dr. Applegate actually did this very interesting study where he compared the intestinal development between a duck and turkey during their first week of life, and as you can see here, the green lines represent ducks. Uh, so the first week of life, ducks really showed uh, significant advantages in terms of intestinal weight, length, and density. In the distal jejunum, ducks had five times deeper cribs and 2.4 times higher villi compared to turkeys. 
So what does this mean? It means that the capability of intestinal development in ducks is really superior compared to broader so turkeys. Uh, and with the ever decreasing age to market, this first one to two weeks really represent a very important period of that entire growing out period to optimize the digestive performance and gut health. So this capability of ducks uh, really is a merit that supports uh, their fast growth. On the other hand, we also know that uh, besides nutrient utilization, this intestinal barrier also serves as the first line of defense against any luminal pathogens. So this thicker intestinal barrier, if you will, or likely higher mucin production or higher protein turnover, we don't know, but somehow this intestinal barrier gives better natural protection for the ducks. So fortunately, we're very lucky that ducks don't have much issue with uh, intestinal health. And because of that, in fact, in our feeds for ducks, we never, ha we never used antibiotics and we never need to. Uh, if you ac accidentally mix coccidiostat in there, it can be toxic to ducks even. So just like you would hear from everybody at Maple Leaf, a duck is not a waterproof chicken. Certainly a lot of waterproof turkey as well. So if intestinal health is not our biggest challenge, then what is? If we come back to this chart, what are the reasons that may, that may prevent us of making this 20% antibiotic free as well? Well, for ducks, um, their respiratory and skeletal um, systems are the ones that are really susceptible that lead to true concerns in our production. Increased costs, of course, is a challenge. How to ensure duck well-being uh, under ABF production is another. And lastly, the really limited uh, research information index just adds difficulty to, to everything. So we'll go into details for each one of these. So first, for respiratory system. In this diagram, you can see the various locations of lungs and uh, air, air sacs of a duck. See how much bigger in size they are compared to chicken. So it's easy to imagine there's a lot of space for respiratory disease and uh, stress. And indeed, these air sacs can get infected very easily, whether it's bacterial, viral, or fungal. But air sacculitis can also be caused by ventilation temperature problems. If, there, if the ammonia is high, if the CO is not controlled well, if you see extremes or swings in temperature or humidity, or if there's dust and dander in the air. Now, in terms of infection, one major agent that is a concern under ABF production is what we call RA, uh, Remarella antipasper. It's a gram-negative bacteria that can infect the ducts either through inhaling from the air or from skin wounds, but mostly from inhaling. And it is highly contagious. So, what, so upon mm, inhaling, that infection can quickly lead to a uh, high mortality of a flock especially a young flock, sometimes you can see up to 75% mortality. In better scenarios, you would see weight loss, uh, a lameness, brain damage, and so on, leading to a lot of duck loss. If you post a duck with an uh, RA, most times you will find lesions in the air sac, along with perihepatitis and pericarditis. And this air sac lesion is also one of the major causes for contamination at processing plant as well. So really, uh, in most cases, RA is the single biggest reason for our loss in, in production. And, and without the support of antibiotics, it's extremely hard to eliminate that, that, that bacteria in the duck barn, and it requires extensive environmental management. Now for infections of other bacteria, uh, E. coli, Salmonella, Staphylococcus, Streptococcus are, are all commonly found uh, infections globally in duck industry. As I mentioned earlier, the skeletal system of a duck can be quite vulnerable, partially due to that really fast growth rate. So for example, in the field, Staphylococcus infection is often seen, which often uh, affects the bones and joints. So you can see uh, swollen joints, lameness, the ducks are reluctant to move and eventually laying down, which then becomes a well-being issue because they can't get access to feed and water. So, so that then either requires antibiotic treatment or if it doesn't work, euthanization. So that's another big reason that leads to um, the reduced head to plant counts for antibiotic free ducks as well. Speaking of duck well-being, it is apparent that many of these diseases will hurt the well-being of the ducks. 
Yet we firmly believe that dark well-being should not be compromised under any circumstances. So at Maple Leaf, we have this very comprehensive dark well-being guidelines that covers every stage of production, that every uh, live production staff and contract producers must um, be trained and certified and must abide by these guidelines. So if a house challenge presents a well-being issue, we will evaluate that uh, situation with a, a consulting veterinarian. And if the ducks need antibiotics, they will have it. So moving forward, if without further tools to really boost the immunity of those birds or to control that infection, if we really want to move to 100% antibiotic-free, ensuring duck well-being can be a true obstacle. In addition, increased production costs, of course, is a challenge um, that can come from sub-maximal usage of barn facilities because you have to reduce stocking density, uh, the increased costs for, for managing barn environment because you have to purchase more disinfectant, uh, uh, water treatment, and, and so on. Fewer flock cycles per year because of that longer downtime in between. Also, the capital investment for improved animal welfare can be significant. For us, because we have focused on it for many years, so it's not a dramatic change, but for many other producers, it will be quite significant. The increased feed additive cost is another one as well. At the same time, many other factors can play a role in determining that producer's ability to raise a flock antibiotic free or not. Among them, day old quality, feed quality, individual farm management skill set if you're using contract growers, uh, seasonal weather factors, government surveillance, especially in developing countries, can all play a role. So really, the challenges for antibiotic free production comes from all aspects of production chain. <coughs> and last but not the least, we know that most of the, of the attention on antibiotic-free production strategies are focused on broilers, some to turkeys, but not much to ducks. So there is a serious lack of information or data on that uh, alternative product evaluation and optimization for picking ducks which inevitably increases the difficulty, the time, and the costs for us duck producers to find suitable solutions for the fur ducks. There are, uh, especially in North America, there are some information from China, but, but most of them are not focused on antibiotic-free strategy yet. And you know that many of the situations or product defects can vary from country to country. So at Maple Leaf, we do lots of lots of research in-house but we also need the support from local researchers in outline industry in order to move forward more efficiently. So um, we need your help, and we hope more attention can be put on DAX moving forward. So I have talked about the main challenges that we have encountered in duck production. Now let's see what, what are the tools that we could use to make it work. Well, unfortunately, we all know that there is no silver bullet solution but I do think that the first solution would be to change your mindset, or change our mindset, uh, to change the mindset of all personnel involved in live production that ABF is possible. I'm talking about ducks. In broilers or turkeys, might be a different story, but ducks, it's possible. Once past that mindset change, uh, many things are indeed possible in the field. Now, of course, in order to be successful over a long run of raising antibiotic-free ducks, literally all parts of the all aspects of the production chain needs to be paid close attention to because antibiotic-free production inherently allows for less error by the producers. So extra attention is required to every detail of production, which uh, if we summarize them into three major parts, that would be nutrition, flock management, and greater in hatchery management. So first for nutrition, I think the first and foremost step for ABF production index would be ensure that feed formulation precision. The reason for that is on one hand, this will help minimize that nutrient access, which is one, often one of the causes that lead to undesired microbial pro proliferation and then leading to lots of intestinal health, health problem. Now, I did mention that for ducks, they are less vulnerable for intestinal diseases, uh, fortunately. However, that doesn't mean that they don't get sick. 
especially under different housing environment. In Asian countries, many of the, uh, the duck barns still have swimming pools for the ducks to play in during the day. So you can imagine in those areas, you, you, you will expect more uh, gut problems and infections overall. And besides, optimal gut health is still key to achieve maximal performance and welfare at, under any production system. Um, on the other hand, I think a more holistic or thorough assessment of the nutrient requirements can help us to, uh, to produce at the least cost and achieve the best outcome. And this means that to, when we formulate feed, we should evaluate the economic return of the whole production chain instead of just one piece. For example, some of the recent studies in picking ducks suggest that the nutrient requirement for breeders might be higher if we look at progeny performance or quality than simply just egg production. So in the past, we probably only formulate for egg production for breeders, but today, under ABF production, we have to take a lot more factors into consideration we have to take a look at how the diets influence breeder immunity, bone quality, um, that egg quality, and consequently progeny quality. For me, that's the same thing, a lot more factors to think about. And of course, to achieve that precision ingredient testing uh, is key, and NIR is, is a quite a useful tool uh, for us so that we can have an idea of the variance in, in, the, in the feed ingredients. And the use of exogenous enzymes or other phytogenic products that boost uh, or optimize that digestibility is, can also be helpful. Now in the meantime, we, we see that there are so many uh, so-called antibiotic alternative products on the market that are focused on gut health. They can all potentially be helpful tools for us if applied properly. Um, at Maple Leaf Farms, we actually have a long history of supplementing prebiotics in feed and also probiotics through drinking water for, for both our breeders and meat ducks. We have our own um, probiotic product that we, it's called Live Pro that we uh, add to drinking water for meat ducks every day. That we have been doing this for a long time and I think that's part of the reasons that contribute to our success today. And at the same time, we are continuing to evaluate many other products, probiotics, phytogenics, organic acids as feed supplements. And I think the duck industry in general is still learning how to use these products uh, to achieve the best outcomes because honestly, there are still many unknowns and inconsistent results than we would prefer. So all of these questions of if this works, how it works, how much does it help, and what's the optimal combination of all these pro different products need to be addressed before we, we can uh, move forward efficiently. Because for life production, the value of this product must be realized in improved economic return, either through reduced feed costs or through improved productivity. Uh, in addition, for the stacks, providing high quality feed is, is essential. Uh, especially for ducks because they are extremely susceptible to mycotoxins. So ABF program needs to have a more emphasis on avoiding that mycotoxin in the feed. Here we take aflatoxin as an example. You can see that when broilers were affected by aflatoxin B1 at about 2 ppm uh, aflatoxin B1, where the ducks on the other hand started to show significantly reduced body weight gain at only 0.1 ppm aflatoxin and 0.3 ppm almost reduced that in half. So if you remember that figure Dr. Afegate showed this afternoon, 0.1, 0.3 are quite realistic doses for, for mycotoxins. Um, we also noticed that mycotoxins can affect gut health in, in ducks as well, and this not only interfere with nutrient utilization, but may also predispose the birds to various other problems like ch ch chastity and Dr. Applegate talked about earlier. So uh, really for this ducks, we need to ensure that the feed is free of mycotoxins. We do multiple testing at our nutrient quality lab uh, on site of our feed meal. We also have a a test called Toxic Screen that utilizes dark cell models to test the uh, overall toxicity of our feeds to really ensure that the feeds delivered to the farms are free of toxins. And in this context, uh, mycotoxin sorbents or other mycotoxin interventions become more necessary for ABF duck production compared to probably broilers. Now, uh, 
Despite all that potential help from all these feed supplements, we must keep in mind that they can only be used successfully in conjunction with good overall management. Just like Dr. Schaefer, our VP of Life Production, likes to say, nothing can substitute for good management of FWA, and that's not the Fort Wayne Airport. <laughs> that's feed, water, and air quality. So essentially, everything that we do in flock management is to maintain that feed, water, and air quality. Feed quality, we just talk about next. Oh, it's not working. Can you? There we go. So uh, first would be reducing stock intensity. We do recommend a maximum of 5 to 5.5 5 .5 to 6 stacks per square meter, uh, depending on whether we use litter or wire flooring. And in duck production, uh, we never reuse litter. And it's also important to keep that litter dry, because you know how much those duck drink. So it takes a lot of effort to keep that dry to avoid any air quality issues or, or growth of molds. In addition, proper ventilation to maintain uh, temperature and humidity according to the age and production phase of the ducts are important, ensuring a longer downtime, uh, usually more than 10 to 14 days, and a really, really good cleaning and <coughs> sanitation in between can help uh, prevent the disease, con disease spread. Vaccination might be an effective tool. Uh, there are a couple of live vaccine products on the market for ducks, and we're still testing to see if that intervention would help us uh, to, to solve these issues. We don't, we don't know yet. Pathogen control is a big one. Um, and at our company, we have several layers of sampling, uh, diagnostics, reporting, and response plans, so we do um, pre-placement barn swaps, and the barn must be negative of bacteria to play, place the flock. We do also um, breeder barn or cloacal swaps at, uh, at many times. Um, eggs, hatchery environment are all sampled and, uh, and tested for that pathogen. So really ensure that we can minimize that risk of pathogen uh, spread in the environment. Last but not the least, ABF program cannot be successful without the proper biosecurity program. I'm sure you all understand the importance of it, uh, so I'm not going to spend more time on biosecurity, but poor biosecurity will no doubt lead to failure in antibiotic-free production. Now, another important aspect for, uh, for antibiotic-free production would be breeder management and hatchery management. So on, to on top of uh, husbandry management of breeders, breeder nutrition is also crucial for adequate development of the progeny. So for example, a, a recent study in Peking Ducks showed that higher breeder vitamins could help improve progeny performance, where you can see improved ha hatch weights, improved body weight, improved FCR. In the same study, they also found that in increased levels of carotenoids can help in improve that hatchability and the diode quality um, from in improved antioxidant function of the embryo. So they're all really linked together, and essentially we just want our ductings to have the best start possible to begin with, especially for a fully integrated um, business like us. Minerals, same thing, uh, impact on the, on the egg respiration. Uh, also, because breeders can transfer intestinal microbes and immunity to that progeny, so ABF programs must then ensure adequate intestinal health, not only in meat ducts, but also in breeders to prevent any possible issues that might get passed on. And then when that egg uh, gets to the hatchery, uh, either during storage or during uh, incubation. Any errors in temperature humidity can have a significant impact on the old quality. Both previous research or field experience indicate that improper temperature humidity can reduce the body weight, intestinal size, digestive enzyme activity of the, the ducklings. Uh, and also one thing that we do at Maple Leaf is that we wash and disinfect eggs. I'm not sure if in the broiler industry they do that, but many of the duck producers do not do that. But th we do that because we want to remove any dirt or microbial contamination on that eggshell uh, 
because any of the contamination can lead to entrance of the bacterial or molds into that egg and cause rots and embryo mortality leading to lower hatchability. Even if the duckling is hatched successfully, our internal observation found that uh, uh, ducklings hatched from unwashed eggs would have higher incidence of leg problems and higher mortality during the first week of life. So egg wash can have a significant impact on hatchability and day-old quality. So in summary, I know I have talked a lot, lot different aspects of the production and I feel like I keep repeating myself that this is important, that it's important, but it is true that every part of the life production is important if we want to make antibiotic free work. And in, despite the possible uh, advantages that ducks have in terms of gut uh, protection, it is still real that we're facing so many challenges in the areas that we have talked about and those we haven't talked about. So for ABF duck producers, uh, we must keep in mind that uh, be ex be, um, pay extra attention to all the details and everything matters because ABF allows for less error by us. So going forward, uh, as I said, the global duck industry is expected to continue to grow and this transition to antibiotic free production is inevitable. Uh, despite many of the research attention on broilers, we must also appreciate the intrinsic differences between these two birds. And so evaluation of products or further tools developed in ducks are needed and really uh, efforts from both the airline industry and live production need to come together and hopefully we can to get work together to um, achieve a balance of nutrition, disease control and management and ultimately bring profitable advancement to our industry. So I think that's all I have. Well, before I stop, um, this is a picture, a satellite shot of our research farm uh, in Milford, Indiana up in Milford, Indiana, and the picture of one of the houses. So like I said, at Maple Leaf, we do lots of lots of research in-house. We have to, and we believe that it is important to continue to do so. So uh, we have, in, in addition to field trials, uh, we also have this farm um, that has five houses that are dedicated for research purposes. So controlled environment, controlled house, floor pins, uh, strong capacity, we can do meat ducks as well as breeder ducks uh, study. So if any of you have any research ideas that you think may benefit maple leaf or benefit duck production in general, please come talk to me. That's my email down here. And I think that's all I have. Thank you so much and thank you for the opportunity.